An RGB LED is just like it sounds. It's an R, G, and B LED, red, green, and blue. Three LEDs in one, so of course it is much more expensive. A couple dollars each from what I've seen. Of course, you get a bulk discount if you're a big manufacturer. But it's a four terminal device. Now you might say, three LEDs in one, wouldn't that be six terminals, two for each? Well. They share inputs and outputs. So on an LED, a cathode is the negative end. It's the output, essentially. The end connected to your negative power. So you can have three pins that are connected to different positives, and then one that's all connected to negative, and they go together. Or you can have common anode, which is the positive end, where they're all connected to the same positive power line, and then they have separate negative lines, separate grounds, separate outputs, whatever, that you can vary that way. Common cathode is the easier one, the one where the negative ends are joined. It's the easier one to deal with, but they're both pretty easy. You just have to remember to flip one or the other. So why does this work? If you combine red, green, and blue. This is how pixels work. Cathode ray televisions, LED televisions, all your devices for decades and decades have used this technology. Uh, on a cathode ray tube television, back in my day, you would have groups of red, green, and blue phosphors that are on the screen. Phosphors are something that glow briefly, super briefly, for about a sixtieth of a second, in fact, when they are hit with an electron gun, and the electron gun goes like a typewriter, lighting up different phosphors in different amounts to make different strengths of light. And then, of course, you're not standing right at the television. If you were to look up at the television, you could see individual of those phosphors. But, you know, you're sitting back on your couch or whatever, and they're all blurred together, and it works nice. And everything now, your phone screen, computer screen, laptop screen, all of it works the same way. You've got red, green, and blue components. Some advanced devices could also have uh, additional special colors the same way that a printer. Uh, when you're on paper, it actually uses cyan, magenta, and yellow to combine colors, but they also use black because if you mix cyan, magenta, and yellow, they don't make a perfect black, so you also have black ink because black is pretty common. So you could do the same thing. You could have red, green, and blue phosphors in a display screen, and then you could have another one that's just white uh, that helps you know, with the brightness control. But generally it's just RGB, and your colors are represented in software as red, green, and blue. They're called channels. One channel for each, sort of like water channels where you're shoving things down, the water's flowing down the channel, like that. So red, green, and blue. And they're all separate electrically. They have one pin connected, but you can operate them separately. And of course we can do it with potentiometers and all this other stuff, uh, but we're going to go ahead and do it with the Arduino, because it's not very instructional to do it manually when you're never going to do that. You're not going to buy an RGB LED and set it to one specific color with trim pots and leave it there. That's way too much money. And unless it's something like a specially colored nightlight, you're probably not going to just have a bunch of knobs that people can turn to change the color of an LED. So computer control, where this is an indicator light, or it's part of some sort of fancy display, is what you're actually going to do with it. And also you might say, well, if it's physically three LEDs, how do they combine to form the color in this package? This is a lot bigger than a phosphor on a television. You're right. And in fact, when this is demonstrated, you can see the individuals. They do blend, but they don't blend particularly well. But you're not going to have this just sticking out of a case somewhere. You've all seen LED indicators on things, you know, just a, a power light or something. And it's inside the panel, and it's just poking out. So you've basically got a circle, a cylinder, cut out, and you've stuck the LED through it. And with only the tip of it showing and this nice little plastic or whatever channel that kind of makes the light go outward and blend together better, it'll look just fine like that when you're actually using it. Sticking in a breadboard, not so much, but you can still see the effect. But... Let's go see how it works electrically. So first we have our microcontroller, such as an Arduino. Connections to the positive power, negative power on the Arduino. And then you've got your LEDs over here. Of course, these are the components within the physical package. They're not three separate LEDs, but electrically they are. It's just they're stuck together inside. So we have three data pins. We're going to call them R, G, and B. These are your PWM pins, just as in the dimmable LED video, we're just dimming three at once. This is going to be a common cathode one, which means all of the negatives 
are joined together. In fact, let me draw it this way. So all of the negative pins are joined together, goes around to the negative Arduino power. And then the positives are from these control pins. And it works the same way. You're not actually getting different voltages out of these, you're turning them on and off rapidly, such as 500 times a second, with a PWM duty cycle. So this positive power is being directly connected to these on or off, going to ground. There's no variation there. It's just how often, overall, on average, it's on versus how often it's off. And this is the easiest one for this reason. But I've forgotten something. We also need resistors. We need to make sure that we have current control. And again, it does not matter whether the resistor is before or after the LED in a series portion of the circuit. Because of Kirchhoff's laws again. It's just a sum of voltage drops. It doesn't matter which order they're in. I would put the resistors first because again, that just feels good to me if we pretend that conventional current is normal. But it actually doesn't matter. Now, if you had a resistor down here, it would matter. But then it wouldn't be in the series portion. It would be connected to all three, obviously. So what we have here is three LEDs and three resistors. Now, again, just like the dimmable LED video, these resistors are configured so that when this is on, in fact, when this is on for blue, this blue part of the RGB LED is as bright as you ever want it. So if you turn this to 100%, this is as bright as you ever want it. It's drawing as much current as you ever want because the current is coming out of the Arduino. It's going through the Arduino. And the Arduino can supply only so much power before it catches fire. If you really wanted some sort of incredibly powerful lights here, like actual full light bulbs, you would instead have transistors here that the Arduino would control with minimal current. And then those transistors would be connected to your external large battery pack or your wall power or whatever. And then they would get supplied that way. And it would be the same effect. But we're not using high powered components here. This is an RGB LED. So we're only operating in the dozens of milliamps for all of them together, even if we want them super bright. So each of these, if we assume full power, the resistor sets it to the brightest you want with the highest current draw you want. And then you have a different value because different colors, that's the thing, different colors of LEDs have different forward voltage drops, which means there's a different amount of voltage left over because you've got the forward voltage drop and then the resistor here drops the rest because you've got your positive power here, your negative power here. So other than your power, this is the only two components. And you say these are high impedance input pins only if they're for input. If you don't have these pins configured as input, then they're not high impedance. So so they're having a negligible effect. These are output pins. Whether the current is going in or out, they're output signals, so they're low impedance. So you've got your forward voltage drop of the LED, and then you've got your resistor taking the rest. If your forward voltage drop of your LED is smaller, then the resistor will be taking more. And as we know, Ohm's law, V equals IR, or I equals V over R, more voltage going through the resistor with the same resistance means that your current is higher, which in turn means your LED is brighter. That's why they each need to be configured. If you have an LED with a lower drop with the same resistor, it's going to be brighter. It might be too bright. Or that same resistor, if you have an LED that takes more, it might be too dim. So that's why we have three different ones. And you can configure them just like usual. Hook it up to your power supply, hook it up to your Arduino. You know, you don't need a full power supply, just have a potentiometer in here, configure it as a variable resistor. So in one end, out the wiper. So not across, not as a voltage divider, but just a variable resistor. And then just tell your Arduino to turn it on and leave it on. Make sure that your potentiometer is turned up first so that you don't get a brief surge of high current. And then just turn your potentiometer down until it's as bright as you want. And then you, of course, use three potentiometers and tune it until like the white is as bright as you want the white. So it's really not particularly difficult to set up. So as I said, just like the dimmable LED video, you turn on and off this and if it's on, let's say, 75% of the time, then you get about 75% brightness. Remembering that our vision is logarithmic, but you see what I mean. It's 75% of the photon generation. So that's why it's easiest. You hook it up, it's intuitive the way you code it, and there you go. So what about the common anode? Because this is the cathode, and this is the anode, which sounds backwards to me, but it's just how the words work. What happens if you have common anode LEDs? A common anode RGB LED. It's actually fairly similar. You hook it up like this. I'm just doing it this orientation because it fits on the board. I'll get out of the way in a minute. So your 
common anode, the positive end, you actually connect positive power together to each of these ends through their resistors, which serve the same purpose, and then you connect their outputs, as it were, to the pins. And that is a common anode setup. Now, you might say, you're putting power into the microcontroller through the pins. Isn't that weird? Well, it can seem weird. The Arduino, or the chip the Arduino uses, rather, and a lot of microcontrollers, in fact, are designed for this. In fact, they can usually sync, as in send to the ground, more current in than out. So you might only safely be able to put out, for some random microcontroller, 10 milliamps out an input pin, but 100 milliamps in an input pin. Those numbers are random. But the point is, sometimes you can actually send more in than out. Uh, you, of course, want to know ahead of time whether or not your microcontroller is designed for that because some of them are not. Pardon the earthquake upstairs. So the positive power is uniformly connected to here, but that's how we controlled it before. Hold on. So we connect our three LEDs, R, G, and B, with the resistors out to ground. And this is configured the same way. These are the same value resistors, common cathode, common anode. Your resistor values are going to be the same for the same internal LEDs because you've still got five volts going through. It's going through in a different way, but as far as the LED is concerned, it's no different at all. Remember, we were not varying the voltage. We're just turning it on and off. So same resistor values you just configured. But how do we control this? Well, remember, these are output pins. It doesn't matter which way the current is flowing. Output means the microcontroller is setting a voltage value measured from the pin to ground. So if these are output pins with the current going out, the conventional current going out, then you're measuring 5 volts to negative or 0 volts to negative. If they're configured as output pins with the current going in, they're configured 5 volts to ground or 0 volts to ground. The point is, output pin means this is setting a positive voltage, and everything else is responding to it. An input pin is high impedance. The point of high impedance is it doesn't want to affect what's coming in. It wants to be only reading it, and the external part is controlling it. So again, it doesn't matter which way the current is flowing. The point is, this is setting a voltage rather than reading it. That's what output means. So in order to turn one of these components on, let's say this one, in order to turn this component on, this output pin is set to zero. But that's off, you say. It's just semantics. It's just how you consider it, because they're all connected to five volts here. If this is zero volts relative to ground, right, so this is five volts relative to ground, and this is zero volts relative to ground, then this relative to this is five volts. Five volts is greater than zero. That means current flows. You have to have a difference in voltage for there to be current. So from here to here, you've got five volts. So your LED is taking whatever. Resistor is taking the rest. It determines your current. Current goes through and into ground. To turn this off, you set this to 1 to 5 volts. Logical 1, actual 5 volts. So basically, this going in to the LED on this end is 5 volts. This coming out, going to this end of the LED, is 5 volts. Or rather, down here at this end of the resistor is 5 volts. So you've got 5 volts here and 5 volts here across the LED and resistor. And there's no difference. It doesn't matter. Nothing's taking anything because there's no difference. That means 0 volts. You know, you, you have 5 volts, you have 5 volts, but across this, you have zero volts, means it's off. So you just reverse the logic. So let's say that before we had the red LED and we wanted the red to be on 75% of the time. So we set the value to 255 divided by four times three, whatever. So we set the Arduino output pin to 255, that's its value. You know, the Arduino pin goes from zero to 255. So zero is 0%. 255 is 100%, 128 is 50%, 64 is 25%. So we set the output pin of the red to 255 times 0.75 for 75%, and that would turn our common cathode LED red component on 75% of the time. So every 500 or whatever of a second, it would turn on for three quarters of that, and then turn off for a quarter, turn on for three quarters, turn off for a quarter. But we reverse the logic here. According to logic values where one is on and zero is off, remember, when we turn this pin on, the LED turns off. So we have to flip it. For a common cathode, this would be on 75% of the time. For this one, a common anode, it would be on for 25% of the time. You turn this on 25% of the time, which turns this off 25% of the time. By setting this to high, this is high because that's what high is. High and high is zero difference, nothing happens. Now, 
Again, this is just a logic value. So you could have a variable in your program that says on equals 255 off equals zero. You could just do that. And instead of writing these numbers, just write on or off. So you say, okay, on, off. And if you have the other type of LED, you just flip it. You can say on is zero. Off is 255. And there you go. But of course, that's only for straight on or off. It's not for the values in between. So in that case, so let's say 255 times 0.75. That's your 75% of the time on. But we want to reverse that. That's easy. 255 minus 255 times 0.75. Let me explain this. If you have 1, that's 100%. If you have 0, that's 0%. If you have 0.5, that's 50%. 0.75 is 75%. You know, you can see 1 times 100 is 100. 0 times 100 is 0. 0. 0.5 times 100 is 50. 0. 0.75 times 100 is 75. So we could even see it like this. 1.00, 0. 0.00, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.75. And you can see how two digits after the point times 100. That's just what these numbers are. They're called factors. It's a number from 0 to 1 when you're scaling something, that is. So if you do 1 minus, well, 1 minus 1 is 0. So we flipped 100% to 0%. 1 minus 0 is 1. We flipped 0 to 100%. 1 minus 0.5 is 0.5. It's the same thing, which makes sense. On half the time, off half the time is the same as on half the time, off half the time. 0.75. 1 minus 0. 0.75 is 0. 0.25. So 75 percent to 25 percent, three quarters to one quarter. That's how this works. It's basically what's left over. So 100 percent is all you got. You got anything from zero to 100 percent. So 75 percent is 75 percent of 100 percent. What's left over? 25. That's what this is. It's the total minus what you took is what you're left over. You're just flipping. So let's do a quick demonstration. So I doubt you can see it clearly with this camera, but the RGB LED has a flat side the same as regular LEDs do, and usually the longer pin indicates the positive and the flat side indicates the negative. That'll be the shorter pin. This one has four pins and they're all four different lengths. As it turns out, this is a common cathode. The negatives are joined. The longest pin is the negative one. You could consider that the common one. And then the flat end is two away. Basically, it's confusing. Look at your spec sheet. But if you don't have a spec sheet, it's easy enough. Stick it in your breadboard and just remember which end was the longest one. So get your power supply. Again, this can be your Arduino. Your Arduino will supply this power if you want. You can also use batteries. You can use the diode test mode on your multimeter if it's a good one. Usually those diode test modes are meant for regular diodes, not LEDs, but they sometimes work. But in this case, let's put the positive and negative power in. We're using an Arduino. So we're setting it to 5 volts. So I will connect positive, actually no, I will connect the negative because this is the negative joined. And I'm going to connect it to pin 1, just whichever one you decide to call 1. Then we have the positive. This is what's coming from the Arduino, which I will connect to pin 2, which, spoiler, is actually the negative end. Now again, I have no resistors. That's a short circuit, but this is current limiting, so we're not going to get the full volts. So what's going to happen is I'm going to set the current limit to 1, and it's going to go up and up and up and up and up and up and up to 5 volts, and you'll see it's supplying basically no current. It's gone all the way up to 5 volts and nothing's happening. Nothing's happening at all. That means it's hooked up backwards. So I will now hook it up the correct way. The negative end goes to pin 2. Positive end to pin 1. We'll set a 1 milliamp limit, and all of a sudden we have light. So that will tell you whether or not you have it hooked up right for any particular element. Now let's say you don't even know if it's a common cathode or anode. You don't even know, right? So what you do is you say, okay, I have my negative pin hooked up to whatever. I have my negative power hooked up to whatever. Let's move the positive one. So now I'm going to move the positive to a different pin, not moving the negative. And it was really bright for a second. You really shouldn't be doing that with the power on, but it's not the end of the world. And it lit up again without moving the negative. That means it's common cathode. The negative and is shared. If that did not work, then you would put the positive pin back where you had it, move the negative pin instead, and then you should light up the other element. And if it still doesn't light up, then something's broken. But remember, this is a current limiting power supply. Your Arduino is not. Your Arduino does not have a current limit built in other than the fuse. So put a resistor, put a potentiometer, something. This is one of the th things a power supply is good for. And it also basically tells us our forward voltage drop of the blue element is about 2.57. And if we turn it up to, you can see it gets bright quickly, 2.79. 
So it varies, but only in hundreds of millivolts. So it's not that major to worry about. So let's set a goal of five amps, milliamps, milliamps, oh boy. So let's say blue. So this will be a total of 15 milliamps when everything's on. We'll say blue equals 2.72. So that is our forward voltage drop at five milliamps for this blue component. Let's turn it down. Let's move back to the red, turn it up to, let's say five. Looks pretty bright. Let's say that's bright enough. So we'll say red equals 1.84, turn it down. And we'll put it on the last pin, set it to five. That was apparently the blue, so, oops. So actually the next pin over, turn down please, thank you. Oh, my poor eye. Blinded by the light, revved up in the night. So now we'll turn it up to five and we can see there's the green. So you'd really wanna test this with all of them connected, make sure white looks white and so forth, but this is good enough. So 2.57, G equals 2.57. And we're now done with that. So we have our voltage goals for when it's fully on. And we have our current goals for when it's fully on. So we can figure out the resistance we need. Five volts minus whatever for the component divided by the current that we want for that component equals the resistor to put in. So let's do that calculation. So first of all, our blue was 2.72 voltage drop. So five, so five minus 2.72 is 2.28. 5 minus 1.84 for the red is 3.16. This is how much voltage the resistor will drop. 5 minus 2.57 for the green is 2.43. Let me make a note that blue was pin, we'll say 3, red was 1, and green was 2 of the color pins. So now we divide all of those by 5 milliamps, which is 0 0.001 amps. So 2.28 for the blue divided by 0 0.001 comes out to 2280. So blue gets a 2.28K ohm resistor. Red is 3.16 divided by 0 0.001. That gets a 3.159K resistor. And green is 2.43 divided by 0 0.001 gets a 2.430K ohm resistor. So we look at our values and we see blue. Blue wants a 2.28K ohm resistor. Well, we've got a 2.2 right there. Green wants a 2.4. Well, we've got 2.2 and 2.7. Green was a little dim, so we'll just go ahead and go with 2.2. That'll be fine. And I'm glad that all of my components, like my laptop and camera and phone are battery powered because I just heard thunder. But then again, the overhead light would go off, so we'd be operating by laptop light. But anyway, we're gonna err on the side of low to give it a little more current and brighten it up. The red wants a 3.1K. Well, we've got a 3.3K or a 2.7K. So we're gonna go ahead and go with a 3.3K. We could go with 2.7, because the red was also a little dim, but that's a pretty big difference. So this is how we decide on resistor values based on what we have. So the, I'm going to reorder these red, green, blue for my own sanity. So the red one was getting a 3.3. So we'll do that one at the top here. And then the green and blue are both getting 2.2s. So the red is going to be the weakest one because it has the lowest forward voltage drop and the highest resistor. In fact, for the same reason. So this is going to be, you might say cooler light, less red. And so so then we've got one for the green and one for the blue. So now we'll hook up the resistors. So this resistor is connected to the first pin, which is red, then connect to green, which is the third pin, color pin two, actual pin three. The third one is going to the blue, which is over here. The output, the common cathode, is connected to the negative power rail. And then we're going to have three different connections from the Arduino to these pins. Those are the output pins from the Arduino. That is getting very close. I hope I do not have to redo this video due to losing power partway through, but we will muscle on somehow. And I need to clean this doggone table. So we'll put our Arduino over here. You can see that still, although that's not going to matter because the point is to see the RGB LED. So we'll plug the Arduino into the laptop. The laptop will supply power and programming. So I'm going to connect. Again, you have to look at the Arduino and see which pins support PWM. So I'm going to connect on this one, pin three, 
is going to go to the R, pin 5 to the G, and pin 6 to the B. Now obviously you are limited in how many output pins you have, so you're not going to hook up a device like this unless it's an incredibly simple one, because Arduino is not that expensive. But if you have the pins to spare, you can certainly do this. But if you are controlling a lot of different LED components and such, you will be using something called a shift register, which allows you to use just a couple pins to control a whole lot of outputs in sequence. But here we go. Oh, and I almost forgot the most important part, actually connecting the power of the Arduino. So the 5 volt is going to be, in fact, I don't need a connection to the 5 volt, because remember, the power, the positive voltage, is coming from the output pins. So we'll only connect the ground to the negative, and nothing happens because none of my pins are outputting. Now I need to write a very brief piece of software. What was it, 356? So I say new sketch, again, don't worry about what I'm doing. I will show you the actual computer screen when it's interesting. Right now, I'm just doing this to demonstrate. So pin mode, in fact, I don't need pin mode. Analog output doesn't require that. So I'm just going to do analog right three, 255. Analog right five, 255. Analog right six, 255. So that should set all of them on fully. Upload, and the LED should, once it's done, turn white. And there it is. Now you might say, that looks blue. Well, like I said, it's the th different components. You can see the green is over here, blue is over here, so the red must be up here. But if you have it, and again, actually it looks a little blue. I forgot because the resistor on the red, too big. We need more red current. So again, you'd use three potentiometers and make it look right when it's white. So let's turn down the other two. Let's leave the red high. Let's turn down the green and the blue to 200. Looks a little better. Let's turn them down to half, leaving the red full. There you go, definitely. Now let's turn them to zero just to confirm that I'm not insane here. And now obviously you can see it's red. So if I turn, let's say, up to 40 on the green and blue, so now it looks, you know, slightly pinkish white. So you can see that the resistor on the red is huge compared to what it should be. So again, it's much easier. Hook it up to three potentiometers instead of calculating directly, like I did. Clearly my method is inferior. Hook it up to three potentiometers, just dial them until it looks right, then read the potentiometers and pick your nearest ones. So anyway, there you go. That's how it works. If we want to have pure blue with a hint of green, then we could do 255 there, and let's do green is 128. So no red, half green, full blue. You know, lots and lots of blue. Let's turn green to 255 and blue to 100. You can see it's getting a little, little algae-like. Clearly, I might be able to just turn up the resistor for the blue, because it's already pretty bright. But again, it's going to look better. Like, on my hand, it might be really hard to see. Let me try with the lights off. You can see that my hand looks mostly green, and if I turn this up to, let's say, 255 red, and let's say 30 green and 30 blue, because our resistors are clearly so poorly configured, and you can see that, you know, it's like a light red, basically. So, that's how an RGB LED works. So you can just set these values in your code and you're golden. So you might say, why couldn't I just use three LEDs, a red, a green, and a blue, or whatever combination I want, and hook them up just like this? You could, you absolutely could. Nothing stopping you, it would work just fine, except the LEDs would be larger and further apart. So they certainly wouldn't blend, they would just look like three LEDs. Now, if you had like an aluminum foil funnel or something, basically like a lampshade that would funnel the light, like you were weren't looking at the LEDs, they were just generating light, and you had a little metal or whatever funnel shooting the light out, and that was what's being looked at, then you could certainly do that. It probably would be not cost effective because you'd have to engineer and put a place for that reflective thing, but if what you're doing is, let's say, you have a device and you want it to glow, right? Like you just have a thing, maybe it's, you know, got one, maybe it's one of those consoles. They have those where you have a video game console, but you replace it with clear plastic so that, you know, you can see all the internals. You could take some LEDs if you wanted and tuck them up underneath there, you know, a whole bunch of them if you wanted. And you could just turn them all on and off in a ring. Like you could put, you know, a ring of them around and, and turn them on and off. And because you're not looking at the LEDs, you're looking at the glow, the reflected light as it emanates out from underneath or even through it, then there you go. That would be an excellent use for individual LEDs. And in fact, would be one of the things the Arduino is intended for. Just sticking a bunch of LEDs around and controlling them with a computer program very cheaply 
like 20 to 30 bucks, and obviously reusable if you ever tire of your little device, unplug the Arduino and use the Arduino for something else. You know, like you just want to have your buddy over for the football game and impress him with your thing. So you hook it up to your Arduino and he goes, ooh, and ah, and uh, he thinks you're awesome. And then you just unplug it and go about your merry way. So that's how an RGB LED works. It's three LEDs in a clever package. And the coding is perfectly easy. If you have a common cathode with the negative end connected, you just turn it on the percentage that you want it on. If you have a common anode with the positive end connected, you just turn it off for the percentage you want it on. So for an Arduino, 255 minus the actual value you figured out. Or you could take one minus your fraction. If you have a number from zero to one, it's one minus the fraction, and then multiply that by 255. It's the same thing. You just distributed the 255 through the parentheses. And that'll do it. So until next time, be seeing you.